God's Word is living and active. And can I uh, repeat the rest of it? It's sharper than a double-edged sword and is useful for teaching, correcting, for training in righteousness. It is useful. It is relevant. Um, and even as the Jetsons were trying to predict what was going to be, uh, today was going to be like, I'm, we're going to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 today, and I believe it is more relevant, more useful, more practical um, ever than it's ever been in life. And uh, I look forward to, to digging into that here today. Uh, so Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. Um, we also are praying together as a church. We're setting our alarm at different times. Uh, so today, I want you to set your alarm now for 552. 552. Um, because there is no 5522 for a time. Uh, so 552 is going to be your time. Cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Aren't you glad that when we sing, God, you're good, you're good, you're good, that it's not tied to our goodness? Um, it's, it's not like he is good whether we're good or not. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that. He is faithful whether we're faithful or not. He is true and he's loving. Um, so cast your cares on the Lord. He'll, he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be forsaken. That word for righteous is not like our righteousness. It's the righteousness of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. There's no one righteous, no, not one. But we are made righteous by his death on the cross. So when you, you just when you're reading that verse, when you're remembering it, just say, God, I'm made righteous because of Jesus. You're not going to let me be shaken. You are good. Uh, I thought it was a little bit ironic. I'm not making fun of this, but to hear the youth singing, you're good, you're good, you're good, um, is not as impressive as to see an 80-year-old or a 90-year-old say, you are good. Why? Because there's track record. There's track record of, of perhaps even a decade where you didn't remember, you didn't know if God really was good. But after a decade, he came through and you realized he truly is good. Even when it seems like he's far away, he's good and we praise him. Uh, so God, today we pray that as we open up your word, that your word would uh, enliven us. Uh, the God, I pray that it would cut us to the quick. I pray that your word would be that living and active and useful double-edged sword here today. Would you cut off anything within us that's not producing life? Would you cut off any tumors in us that are producing premature death? And God, I pray that you would fill us now with your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, through 2022, there's three different times when uh, we're going to be preaching from the book of Genesis. Uh, we've already done Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start today in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, as you remember at the beginning of the year, I ask you, I want you to create something in 2022. I hope that you're doing that. It's all based on Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, God is a creator, and he's created us in his image. And when we, when, we, when we create something, we understand what it means to be the creator, what it means to be the created. And getting that into our minds to under, and say to, our, say to ourselves, you are the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and make me. Um, God, you are the creator, I'm the created, I pray that you would mold me into your image in exactly the way that you fashioned for me uh, my purpose. We're going to take this a step further. I'd like you to send pictures of something that you've created, and we're going to fill the, the lobby with pictures of things that you've created. So you can email those to the church, and uh, we want to put those out. The only exception is if you're a baker then don't send me a picture of what you baked. Send me the thing that you baked, and I'll get a picture of myself eating it. Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> um, like, make something. Like, if you're a baker, make something. If you're a woodworker, make something. If you work with metal, whatever you do, if you knit, make something. Be a blessing to somebody. Uh, think about what, what you could. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, Caleb and I have been uh, creating this um, up here. Uh, so uh, can you tell me what it would be? 
it's a bunk bed. Uh, why would I create, why would Caleb want to create a bunk bed? Because there's a, a little, another little girl coming along. So um, as we were making this, I was thinking of Cora and Joanna uh, that will be in this a bunk bed. I was thinking of conversations that they will have together in this room. Uh, I, was I was praying that God would fill their conversations, um, that they would be a blessing and encouragement, that they would be lifelong friends with one another from what happens in this bunk bed. That's, that's what I'm praying for. Um, so there's, you can look at it and go, that's designed for two. Why? Because there, we, we needed two. So think about this. You were designed for a purpose. You can look at the way you were designed. You look at the way you were created and say, God, how did you make me? What did you, what did you make me for? What is my purpose in life? And know that there's a creator and there's creation. So one thing I've learned in Genesis chapter 1, um, Genesis 1, uh, remember uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and there's day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4. I think of, of Genesis 1 as the first psalm. Psalms just have that lyrical content. They, they're, they're packed with who God is. And I think of Genesis 1 as the, the psalm of creation and exactly how God created. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, there's a verse that I don't know if any of you have picked up on, if any of you have caught. Um, and it says this, Genesis 2, verse 4, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. You can look at that verse and go, well, that's the, like the book ends of, of Genesis 1. You know, God created the heavens and the earth, and then this is the, the ending to that. But you know what? Um, as I begin to look at this, and as you begin to dig into this, what it really looks like is Genesis 1 was one account of creation, and then Genesis 2 is another account of creation. And they're different. In fact, you could look at Genesis 1, this, this lyrical psalm of God's creation, and you could go, this emphasizes the power of our God, that he could speak and everything would be created. Then what does Genesis chapter 2 emphasize? It's not identical. It doesn't look the same. There are differences in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and if you believe it all to be true, you go, well, if this is different than this, which one is correct? They both are. They both are, but they're both emphasizing a different thing. Well, I was telling you about our creation of that bunk bed. And did you hear my description of it? It was all about purpose. We made it for two. I, if I were talking to a woodworker, I would have went through and said, you know what, we got all of the wood from um, lumber at my dad's house, we planed it down, and then we, you know, we used glue to sandwich these two together, and I, you know, but I didn't do that. I told you the purpose for that. So the, here's what I'm seeing in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 2 tells the purpose for creation. If one is like the power of our God, Genesis 2 is the, the personal God, the relational God, the, the reason why we were created. So let's dig into this, and uh, you'll find something very, very interesting about the way in which we are created. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth. That's the reason why I think he's starting over, because in Genesis 1, there were shrubs. Uh, there were things that were created. So this is a, this is a start over. No shrub had yet appeared on the earth, no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Well, Genesis 1, at, uh, the man was created, um, so it's a start over. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Last week, Caleb really described this, that we were made both of dust 
in the breath of God, which produces life within us. It's the breath of God. It's the Holy Spirit that lives within us that, um, that, that gives life to every one of us. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. In this description, um, now God who's created everything, he could have put the man in a desert. He could have put him on a beach. How many of you would rather be on the beach right now? Um, could have been in the mountains that he put him. He places them in a garden. Like, why, why would God put the man in a garden and not on the beach? What would be the difference? What are you doing in a garden that you're not doing on a beach? You're working. <laughs> you're working. I love this because this is before the fall. We were made to work. Um, the person who just won the billion-dollar lottery, um, if you have said, um, you know what, when I win the lottery, you won't see me at work, um, you know what, you, you will go back to work one day. Every one of us were made to work. Um, even in retirement, like we're made to do something, we're made to work. Um, this being pictured in a garden, my, my grandmother I had this quote that one is nearer to God, God in a garden than any place on earth. That idea. When I was growing up and I was weeding the garden because of the fall, uh, when I was weeding it, I was like, I, I'm nearer to hell than any place on earth. I don't know. I don't know if you like. Oh, I would rather be anywhere else than right here. What What's the difference? Um, one is that we're made to work. After the fall, there's the struggle to survive. And really, isn't that the pressure? Like, if you take away worry from our life, if you take away, like, um, the need to get something in our life, like, work is quite pleasurable, isn't it? Like, we can, like, put our minds to doing something. God places the man in a garden um, where he'd form. Let's move on. Now, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Um, anybody like me that you, know, like you can turn your head with a tree? Like, man, that's a beautiful tree. There's all these kinds of trees. They were good-looking trees. You see that? Like, pleasing to the eye, they were good for food. It wasn't just a few of them. They're all over the place. These trees, that, like, everywhere you turned, you saw a beautiful tree that you could grab the fruit from. Think about that. If uh, there's a tree, which, what kind of tree would you love to have the fruit of it in your backyard where you could just grab it and you could get that, that freshness? All of these trees everywhere in the garden, pleasing to the eye, good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So how many trees are there? We don't know how many. They're everywhere. But right dead center is this tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, you'll find from Genesis all the way to Revelation, talk about the tree of life. The tree of life is what it's God's provision. And God gives us everything that we need for life. Can you, can you say that to yourself? Like, God gives me everything that I need for life. And when we go to God for life, when we go to God for everything, whatever you have need, you cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. You go to God for life. So here's this tree right next to it, right in the center, is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So these two trees, they may look a lot alike, but they're not a lot alike. If we move on to the next verse, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. And take care of it. The Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Just complete freedom in there. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You catch this? There's an amazing amount of freedom, an amazing amount of life, an amazing amount of goodness. And then there's this one boundary that God says, don't go there. You go there, 
then it, it will produce death. Don't we need to figure out what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is? Like, what is it? Like, when am I, when am I in the tree of life? And am I eating from the tree of life? When have I started to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because one produces life, eternal life. One produces death. And we don't want to go there. Um, so these two trees are so very important to us. Wh now, what's the description of them? They're desirable. They're, they're good for food. They're pleasing to the eye. A little bit later in Genesis chapter 3, you'll have the, the temptation of Adam and Eve. And you'll notice that when Eve was looking at this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, notice what she says about this, uh, Gen the, the last verse there. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. What's the description of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Like desire. It is good. It is desirable. And I think what you, every one of us needs to understand in life is that we have hungers and desires within us that can lead to life, and we have hungers and desires within us that if not, if not, going, if not going God's way will lead to death. It's right here in Genesis. Anybody hungry? <laughs> uh, Everyone, anybody plan to eat today? Isn't it amazing that God would make human beings and in every one of us place desire, place hunger, place an appetite to the point where every one of us is going to go and eat something today unless you choose not to, <laughs> but you have to force yourself not to because it's, it's a desire that's within us. And what God is saying is, is if you can be satisfied in me and my provision, it will lead to life. If you go outside of this and you try to get satisfied in something else other than me, um, you know what? It'll just open up the, the word more in your life. Let me il illustrate this. I told you that there's a Culver's opening up right next to our subdivision uh, so that I cannot go into our subdivision or out of our subdivision without seeing this Culver's um, that's opening up. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Someone tried to really, um, I don't know, hurt me this week by telling me that they don't sell ice cream at Culver's. It's custard. It's the same thing, you know. I don't care if it's custard. They call it whatever you want. Um, um, I want it. Um, <laughs> so think about this. There was a point in my life when I'd never had ice cream before. And then somebody gave me ice cream, and I ate it for the first time. And what was the next word out of my mouth? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good one. I was thinking of more, more. Like, I'd like that. I'd like more of that. You know what? That's all over our life, where we get a taste of something, and the next thing out of our, life, out of our mouth is more, 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 more. To the point where you can have all that you want, but it's never truly satisfying. Haven't we found this in all kinds of areas of life where we, we get something and then we want more and more and more? And then it, why does it never truly satisfy? Because we've gotten into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've, we've been opened up in an area to where something that can't satisfy, only God can truly satisfy. This week I was with my dad. He told me a story about a guy who um, has been helping him. Uh, my dad's 90 years old and he's still working and doing things, but he was taking a, a trailer full of brush. He was taking it to the dump to unload it. He told my mom that it'd take him an hour and a half to do this. On the way there, he passes another man who stops and says, can I help you, Ralph? And this guy hooked up some straps and everything. Fifteen minutes later, they pulled it all off and it was done. My dad was back home. He was just talking about like how amazing this man is and how helpful and how loving he is. And then he said this to me about the man. Um, he, he goes to our church. He's been struggling to quit smoking. 
And just recently, he went four days without smoking, and he just said, I can't do it any longer. Now think about that. There was a day in his life that he takes a cigarette, and now he wants nothing more than to stop taking them, and he's started going into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's just, his, he's been awakened. Now, um, I don't struggle with that. Why? Because I've never had one. I've never tasted of that. But do you see how it, how it works? That we can get into an area of our life where we think it'll satisfy, but it just screams more and more and more, and it doesn't truly satisfy. Here's the point God's saying right from the beginning. There's only one that satisfies. There's only one that satisfies, and that's God. God created us to look to Him for satisfaction. It can also get this way. You can, you can find something that is helpful and satisfying and wonderful in your life, and then you can come up with a way in which, like, I'm going to feed on this. Let's use this illustration because it's just the opposite. It's really, really positive. You'd start to read the Bible, and it starts to be life-giving to you. And you begin to think, you know what? I want this to continue in my life. And so I'm going to create a habit, a pattern in my life where I start to read the Scriptures day in and day out. And in your discipline, you say, I'm going to read five chapters a day of the Bible. You start to read. It starts to produce life within you. It starts to be really helpful to you. And then you meet somebody. Um, and as you're talking to the person, you find out that they are reading the Bible too. And that it's been really life-giving to them. And in the conversation, you find out that they don't read five chapters a day. They read four chapters a day. And then you go, oh, if you were really, really good, you would read five a day, not four a day. And do you see how you can so easily get suckered from the tree of life to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where something was so helpful, so good, so practical, whatever it is in your life, like everything that's good is a whisker away from being like in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then things that like we shouldn't be opening our eyes to, we're a whisker away and we're a step away from our eyes being opened in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what do we do about this? You know what? God formed every one of us. He placed within us hungers. He placed within us desires that we would long for Him, that we would pant for Him, that we would seek Him and Him alone, that we would seek Him and find Him when we search for Him with all of our heart. Um, when I was uh, uh, just in seminary, uh, there was this older pastor, and I've maybe told you this story before, but on Christmas Eve, he wakes up, he's a very elderly man, and on Christmas Eve, he just starts to go looking for the star of Bethlehem. Um, now, um, it's 20 degrees out, he goes out in his stocking feet in a robe, and we couldn't find him for about six hours. Do you know what I'm so amazed and so, so longing for in that? Is I hope that I can be his age. And I could be seeking God. I could be searching for God. Because I know that if I would be seeking for Him and searching for Him and longing for Him in that kind of a passion, I'll be pretty satisfied. <laughs> but you know what? You could win the lottery. Um, you could attain the mountain for which you're trying to get at. And inside, it'll only scream more. Uh, Jerry West is a, a former NBA player, uh, won a championship with the Lakers, uh, became a general manager for the Lakers, won championships with that. He is the low, and the NBA logo is Jerry West. Literally, they made it from, um, you know, fr from his silhouette. Jerry West um, says today, it feels like I haven't accomplished anything. <laughs> How can you become the logo in your profession and feel like you haven't accomplished anything? It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whatever you start to pursue that's other than God will scream, I want more, and will never satisfy. But when you search for him as the deer pants for the water, 
then you will be truly satisfied. It's right there in Genesis. It's the start. And um, this is the way you and I are wired. I want to ask you today to begin to look at your hungers, begin to look at your appetites, begin to look at things that satisfy in your life. Are you looking to God for that true satisfaction? Um, we're going to sing that song. That It's from Psalm 42. Um, and I just want you to imagine that deer that was created to look for water. And you and I have been created to search for God. So let's, let's bow in prayer. God, I pray today that you would set us free from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that promises so much and just fails to deliver. God, we look around and right next to it is the tree of life and there's so many other things that truly satisfy that you've created for good and to please us. God, could we find our pleasure in, in you and your, in, in what you provide? God, I pray today that you would set us free here as we, as we worship you. Oh 
spirit healed cause you Our God, I pray that you would be Lord, um, Lord over our desires. God, I pray that this week, um, even, even just today, that we could declare to you, you're the only one that truly satisfies, that apart from you, I have nothing, but with you, I have a heart that's full. God, fill us now with your Holy Spirit. I pray that as we go, uh, that we would be also on the search for, for others that, uh, that need you and only you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.